So welcome, everybody, <coughs> to uh, this week's uh, Science and Cooking Lecture. Uh, we're really pleased to have, uh, I think, our first uh, chef from China. Um, and we like to get real diversity, and I think we're achieving that this time. Um, before we start, let's see. How many people is this the first lecture you've come to? And how many people have been here before? About 70%. Uh, um, how many here last? How many people were here last week? Well, oh, you're lucky, right? You know that each week we have a quiz based on last week. Um, normally, we have uh, our special aprons with all the equations on them, but this time. This time we have something special. The aprons are on order and we're waiting for them. <laughs> this time we have a book by uh, Ramon Morato, uh, a chocolatier from Barcelona who was here several times but already a few years ago. And he left us some of his books both in Spanish and in English. And so we'll be giving one of these away, two of these. So. Remember, last week was Wiley from Do's Donut, Wiley Dufresne. And he cooked special donuts. So the first question is, what are the two types of browning reactions that occur on the surface of the donuts when they are fried? Yes. Caramelization and Maillard reaction. That's right. And you know, Wiley is very particular about the donuts that he cooks. Right? Very particular. So which time did he make? You. Cake donuts. Cake donuts, exactly. Thank you. I can't throw these to you. <laughs> They're a bit, uh, a bit heavier. So uh, we've talked a lot in class and in these lectures about mouthfeel, something that um, I say is really important and actually really difficult to absolutely quantify. In fact, I would say that there's still a lot of research that goes on to try and absolutely quantify what mouthfeel is because it's both a scientific measurement and a perception. And that makes it much more difficult. Uh, what we talked about before was something that is very important to uh, mouthfeel is the elasticity, how solid a food is. So we can go from something like these rock candies, which is very solid, to meat, which is pretty tough, but not as solid, to something like jello, still a solid, but much, much less elastic. Today, we're going to talk about the opposite of something that's solid, and that's something that's fluid. And many foods are fluid or have fluid taste, and the consistency of the fluid-like behavior of a food is something that's called viscosity. And today we're going to talk about viscosity. And I'd like to introduce uh, to you today, uh, before the talk, the different ways that chefs use to change the viscosity and hence the mouthfeel of fluid-like uh, parts of the food. And then Vicky will show you examples of that. And I ask you, and we'll try and do it actually during her talk, to think about uh, each of these different sauces that she'll discuss, to think about what leads to the viscosity, what leads to the, vis the, the different uh, behavior. So there are wide ranges of foods, all of which involve different types of liquids. Even this, the sauce is liquid. Um, all of them have a very different mouthfeel, and all of them are made up of fluids, 
we quantify that by the viscosity of the fluid. And here are three examples, and I'll show you some in a minute. Uh, water pours very easily. And so the meaning of viscosity is how easily something flows. The more easily it flows, the lower the viscosity. So clearly, water and honey have very different viscosities. I'll try and demonstrate that. This is just a funnel with a very narrow neck. And there's a cup. Here's some water. If I pour this water through the funnel, you'll see that it flows really quickly. But here is my honey, which is molasses. And if I pour this, let's see if I can do it. You see, I can barely pour it, and it's flowing, but it takes a much longer time for it to flow through. It flows much more slowly, it's much thicker, so we say it's an increased viscosity. And in the pictures that you see here, um, the bread dough, you might ask, what's he talking about? That looks like a solid, right? If I could demonstrate it, and I put some bread dough here, right here, it would look like a solid. In fact, a good piece of bread dough I could bounce on the floor, it'd bounce up. But if we came back at the end of the lecture, you'd see that it spreads. So it's super viscous. It's very, very viscous. So things that even if they're really viscous, they have a solid-like behavior, but they still flow, so they're still liquid. And <clears throat> we'll hear today about sauces. Sauces are something that chefs use all the time. They're liquids, but they try to control the way they feel in your mouth, the way you sense them, their savoriness, and you do that by changing the viscosity. In all cases, you start, or in most cases, you start with a liquid, and somehow, that's, that has a fairly low viscosity, somehow you increase the viscosity. You can use a reduction. A reduction is where you boil the water off, and you're left with uh, much more solid-like particles in it. It's a much higher concentration, and that increases the viscosity. Uh, you can use starch. Starch is a common kind of thickener. We won't really see much example of that uh, today's lecture, but it's a very commonly used way of thickening uh, sauces. Um, we can use an emulsion. This is mayonnaise. This is, in fact, what the lab is this week. Uh, it's mixing two fluids, two immiscible fluids together, and you get a much creamier, but still uh, a liquid behavior. This still is a liquid. It looks very solid, but eventually it will flow. And finally, you can use a variety of types of thickeners. Uh, these are usually polymer thickeners like xanthan, and uh, we'll see some examples of that today. Let's understand just a bit physically how uh, viscosity occurs. And what it depends on is how easily things flow over one another. And I'm going to uh, give you some sort of scientific examples, but I'm also going to give you an example that you can really get a good sense of yourselves about how viscosity works. So if I have things like molecules or particles that are really widely separated, they, when they flow, they can easily flow over one another. However, if I increase their number, then it becomes more and more difficult to flow. And we, as a way of describing that, we talk about volume fraction. And here's a picture of volume fraction. This, it's easy for somebody to walk through this crowd. It's much more difficult to walk through the crowd here. And I'm going to give you an example of the volume fraction. I look at this room. And I say the volume fraction here is about 80%. 80% of the seats are taken. right? That's what it is. What fraction of the volume is occupied by whatever is giving the viscosity? And did you know it? You guys are viscous. You didn't believe me. 
Okay, I'm going to give you a very simple set of experiments so you'll understand exactly what I mean. Right now, if you would like to get up and go out, it's fairly easy. But what happens if the molecules are much larger? Spread your arms. Come on, guys, get more viscous. <laughs> it's much harder for you to walk out. It's much harder. The size of the molecules plays a big role. The larger the molecules, the more difficult it is to flow over one another. There is another kind of viscosifying, which is a very cool kind, very widely used, and that's where you use polymer, like xanthan gums, to viscosify. Oops. So you add really a very small amount of polymer. And the thing about a polymer is it very spread out. It occupies a large amount of volume, even though it's not very much. And I can give you another example. Every third person spread their arms and touch the person two people away. If you do that, go ahead, try it. Come on. <laughs> See, he's, he's blocked. You can't move. It's become more viscous. Even though even though it doesn't fill all of space, the fact that they spread and they're attached together means that it becomes much more viscous. And you add a small amount of polymer, it's like just three or four of you spreading your arms and joining together and spreading across the whole room. You block other people. You make it more difficult for them to move. And that's what the polymer does. And so polymers, even though you have a small amount, they occupy effectively a huge volume. They spread out. So again, it's a large volume fraction, and it looks like it's something viscous. Now, the interesting thing about polymer, again, I think I ask you just to think about if you joint, a few people join together in your hands, and you try and move, you have to stay together when you move. What happens is you run in, you collide. Here, you collide with other thin things, and you can't move. But you're not permanently bound. And you can move by, as a line, moving across. That's called reptation. That takes a long time. So things do relax. Things do move. But they just move very, very slowly. And that's why small amounts of polymers lead to a large increase in the viscosity. And that's a uh, very uh, <coughs> common way for uh, chefs to increase the viscosity. So here, that's the reptation. They can only move along here. They can't move sideways, or they collide with their neighbors. OK, so we're going to see a whole bunch of different ways of using these and other things to viscosify um, sauces. And so we're really pleased to have uh, Vicki Lau. She was named uh, America, uh, Asia's best female chef in 2015. She's a Tate uh, dining room and bar in Hong Kong. And please welcome Vicki. University and the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Such an honor to be here today to be speaking in front of this audience. I'm excited today to talk a little bit about my passion, my story, about my restaurant Tate Dining Room, and of course about viscosity in my cuisine. So I'd like to start off a little bit introduction of myself. So before I became a chef, I was a graphic designer. I studied graphic communications at New York University. I was drawn to very much creating things at the time, and still. There was one class in particular that spoke to me in which the professor introduced us to a manifesto written by Ken Garland, encouraging designers to go back to their roots and also creating things that would positively impact humanity, no matter where we are and where we're going. After graduation, I was lucky to find my first job at Green Team Advertising. It is the first social conscience agency in New York as a designer there. 
I had learned a lot about creating concepts around culture. After a few years wanting to return to my roots, I moved back to Hong Kong and I started my own design shop, design department. But I was not creating the things that I was originally set out to be as a designer. I wanted to create more on culture and I started to think about incorporating more sensory into my work. One friend at the time that shared the same office with me also shared an interest in cooking and we would talk about food day in and day night out. So we had heard that in Bangkok they opened a cordon bleu and we dreamt about going there. Shortly, we made that happen. It was originally going to be a leisure three months course, but I really enjoyed it. So I'd finished the nine months intensive course in cuisine and pastry. I became obsessed in learning how to cook and experimenting at home, burning things and burning people's home <laughs> and <laughs> visiting markets and collecting cookbooks. After culinary school, I was curious, how does a restaurant work? How do they churn out so many dishes in such a short time frame? I joined a French restaurant, Cepage, in Hong Kong, and I worked there as a commie chef. So there I acquired more skill on culinary and kitchen culture and how to run and operate a restaurant. I felt comfortable creating in the kitchen and it became a place for me to extend my home for my creativity. My canvas is now on the plate. After a year at Cepage, I wanted to combine what I know as a designer and chef and start out my own place. As a designer, we work with concepts, materials, color hues. As a chef, there are all aspects that we need to work on on a dish with the added dimension of culinary techniques. So I started my own small restaurant, a 20-seater restaurant, Tate 1.0, which originally was only going to be a cafe. But as I test dishes, I wanted to do more. I wanted to tell stories on my plate. So now it uh, became a fine dine restaurant. But on hindsight, this was um, pure ignorance. I had no idea the role of a chef and owner is so demanding. Shortly after we opened the restaurant, we gained our first Michelin star. And in year 2015, I was given the title Asia's Best Female Chef. This opened up to more exposure and opportunities. And at the same time, I realized I have a social responsibility. And I should redefine myself. The dishes I was putting out originally was more on the gimmick side and I was more visual and I wasn't focused so much on taste and I needed to get back into that. I wanted to get back more into my roots as well, creating more flavors around my nostalgic flavor palette. In year 2016, I was blessed with a little baby girl. Journey into motherhood made me appreciate nature even more Somehow, I thought it was a good time to move my restaurant to a bigger space. <laughs> so today, we have a 40-seater restaurant, a catering company called Butler, and also a pastry shop that focuses on Chinese and French um, pastries. So to me, cooking is a combination of art, crafts, and science. The art is what you would express on the plate. Craftsmanship is the obsession of redoing something many times and how small you would like to cut the vegetables. <laughs> and science is your choice of ingredient and the cooking techniques and the equipments used. My cooking philosophy is simple. Respect your ingredients and create delicious, delicate emotions and flavor for my diners. To me, a chef's role is a humble one. We're simply a connector between farmers and diners. My current menu is inspired by Pablo Neruda's Ode to Poem. Each course represents a different ode to something, paying homage to everything that surrounds and inspires me. To me, each dish is a gift to my customer, and I want them to know that every dish that goes out has been crafted with care. The flavor profile and cooking techniques that I use is French and Chinese. The taste and mouthfeel 
of these two cuisines are fundamentally very different. The fat used is different. French uses butter, Chinese uses fat. The French uses dairy and milk, Chinese uses more rice and cornstarch. And the stock made is very different as well. So naturally, in order to marry these two cuisines, I have a lot of technical issues. And I realized the key to successfully marrying these two cuisine in a dish is actually in the sauce, getting the sauce right. When we talk about sauce, it is not only the flavor, which is most people associate with, but also in mouth, mouth feel and structure and thickness. Mouth feel. Why does eating a spoonful of honey that literally melts in your mouth taste so decadent? Why is it that when I feed my daughter something so gooey, she would immediately spit it out? At a tender age, we do care about texture just as much as flavor. These are all questions about the sensory perceptions of taste and especially how food feels in the mouth. Our liking and rejecting certain food is dependent on how it feels in our mouth, rather than just how it tastes and smells. In the long tasting menu, we want to keep our diners excited throughout the journey, and not just have one or two courses that stands out. So one of the elements that I think a lot about when creating a dish is balance. Balance in flavor, sweet, sour, umami, bitterness, balance and mouthfeel is just as important. For example, if we have a consomme soup and we just get the flavor right, but it finish, finishes short in the mouth, it won't be so enjoyable. So how do we prolong that? We can add some fat or gelatin to give substance. But first, let's define what is sauce. The word sauce is a French word taken from Latin, meaning salted, which also means concentrated flavor. When we have a nice piece of steak cooked, having a sauce to accompany that enhances flavor and gives balance to the dish. The classical French cuisine has five mother sauces, bechamel, velouté, espagnol, hollandaise, and to tomato sauce. The Chinese cuisine has soy sauce, hoisin sauce, fish sauce. All these sauces are chosen as mother sauce, not only because of its flavor, but also by its viscosity. In Chinese, there are two words that describe sauces, zheng and zhap. Zheng actually refers to viscosity sauce and a viscous sauce, and zhap actually refers to a sauce that's less viscous. The texture of a sauce is largely determined by its thickness. And for this thickness, scientists refer as viscosity. Viscosity is how fast liquid will fall when there is a particular pressure. And how the liquid can flow is actually the molecule inside the liquid has to overcome each other. So by creating resistance or friction will cause viscosity. So what is inside a sauce? In fact, it's composed of two parts. First, continuous phase, and second, a dispersed phase. If we just try to make a sauce become less viscous, we add more continuous phase. On the contrary, if we think the sauce consistency is not enough, we would add more dispersed phase. Mayonnaise would be the perfect example for this. Vinegar dispersed as droplet in continuous phase of oil. And in fact, the sauce consistency can be tuned or optimized by using the different proportions of the continuous phase and the dispersed phase. Adding more oil if you would like the mayonnaise to be less viscous. So I've broken down the physical factors of viscosity into four factors. First, temperature. Is it a hot or a cold sauce or soup? Second, concentration of the solute. 
how much is being dissolved into the solution. Third, the type of molecule. Is it a large molecule or a small molecule? Fourth, the substance. This can be gas, liquid, or solid. I'm now going to show two videos of each factor. The first is a plating so that you know what we're actually making. And then second is the making of the sauce. now de demonstrate how we make the sauce that we see at the end, and then I'm going to go back and describe what was on the dish. So with here, we have some dried hibiscus and Chinese liquors, some hawthorn, dried orange peel and mint, osmanthus flower, and also Chinese mulberry. And then we infuse it in the water like a tea around 90 degrees. So this is a traditional um, Chinese soup that we normally drink when we want to digest better. So this is a perfect for, for a dessert. So I added in some rock sugar and honey. Stir it around together. And then I'll now strain it. Strain out all the dried goods that's been infused. So you can see the texture is quite liquid. So in order to combine it with the dessert, we need needed the texture to be optimized to something thicker. So I added in my best friend, Santana. So Santana can be added when it's warm and you whisk it together nicely. Bubbles occur when you whisk it, but then it subsides over time. And now you can see the sauce has been thickened and become more viscous. So what was on this dessert? First, I had put in a yogurt meringue, the, the hard shell, and in it, I had put in some osmanthus mousse, and the five bits is a ginger sable, and also a scoop of fresh raspberry ice cream. On top, there's a little floating island of poached meringue. On top of the floating island are sliced plums and a little bit of garnish. So in order to have all these texture combined, because there's a lot going on, there's crispy, there's softness, there's the freshness of the fruit. So I use the sauce to combine it all together. So Dave, do you want to help me out on the science side of this? So why did that sauce become viscous? We know that now, right? It's the polymer. It's the xanthan. Just a small amount. You saw how small an amount she added. Yet it spread and it filled all of space and it made it much more viscous. Tiny amounts of these thickening polymers will increase the viscosity large amounts. 
The heat will keep things, uh, will lower the viscosity at higher temperatures and will probably increase the viscosity, it will probably increase a bit at lower temperatures. But with xanthan, it may increase the gelation, but not much. I don't think it was too, it didn't look to me like it was too temperature dependent for the xanthan. When, it, when this um, sauce cools down a little bit, it becomes more viscous. That's why the temperature is important in this. So when you pour it out in front of a customer, it doesn't get stuck, or it, if it's too liquid, it will splatter all over. So let's go to the next video. make the sauce for this dish. So I've vacuum packed um, some local mussels and as well as some local clams into a sous vide bag. And I've heated the water around 90 to 100 degrees. The reason why we do this is because I want the maximum extraction from the shells so that there's nothing other than the shells flavor in it from the sea. And Actually, in this dish, we don't need to add any salt because all the saltiness comes from the shells. So after that, we strain out all the juices, and that would be the basis of our sauce. And in this, I've added my best friend again, Santana. So we can see that this bubbled up more than the other one, which I don't actually know why. <laughs> so in this dish, I have a nice piece of steamed Japanese sea bass. And then on the side, I've added in some mas masutake mushroom, that's in the little brown bit, and a crispy lotus root, a little bit of zucchini ball, and uh, the part where I injected the fish was some parsley sauce so that you can get a little bit more of the herb flavor inside the fish. And the foam is a sea foam. So all these combined, you get all the flavors from the sea. And Dave, you want to help me out on this? <laughs> so again, I think the viscosity comes in part from the xanthan. But remember what she told us is that whatever she's extracting from the shells is really important. And uh, Vicky was trying to tell us that things that were really salty were more viscous. And I couldn't really believe that. But I think if you look at the sauce just before she adds the xanthan, to me, it looked a little bit more viscous than it was before. So I think that somehow she's extracting something from the shells that's adding to the viscosity, whether it's a little gelatin or something like that, I'm not sure. It also, to me, explains why the foam was more stable because it's more viscous. And stability of foam is just how fast it takes to drain the water out because it's much more dense. And it seemed to take longer to drain out. That's what I think is happening. Awesome.
So now we're making the scallion sauce. So this sauce flavor actually comes from a very traditional kind Chinese cuisine when you eat steamed fish, you have soy sauce, uh, scallion, ginger, and coriander. But I made it into more a puree. So I have some chicken stock here. I infused it with some coriander, um, a bit of Chinese licorice, and uh, white peppercorn. Just let it infuse a little bit to get all the ar aromatics into the stock. And then here I have some stir-fried scallion and ginger and coriander that's been tossed in hot oil. And I add in the infused stock and then puree it together. So this is a good example of large molecule connecting together to make a high viscosity sauce. So you can see without adding anything, it's quite a thick sauce. So in this dish, I've included the scallion sauce, blue lobster that's been steamed. People ask me why the blue lobster is so round and big. It's because I put two pieces of lobster together and then bind it together. That's why it's so round. Um, and on top, I've added some pineapple that's been marinated in passion fruit, a little bit of lily bulb, and some cress. And on the side, the foam is made out of Shaoxing wine and as well as Vinchon. So it's a, a marriage between French and Chinese cuisine. Dave? They're clapping for you. <laughs> so why did that become more viscous? What she did was she ground up the scallions and the ginger that she cooked in oil. The first thing that I thought, well, it's probably the particles that were grinding into it. It's like a reduction. Let me ask a question, though, to think about it a little bit more. Could it be that we're changing the volume fraction as we grind things? You're, you're nodding your heads, but you're not increasing the volume. So whatever the volume fraction is, it's the same. I think what's happening is that we're grinding them up, and as Vicky says, the particles are starting to be cut and they're starting to stick a bit to one another. The volume fraction is just that, it's just the volume fraction. Unless they can spread, unless they can join together, like a bit like the polymers do, where a very small amount of polymer occupies essentially a large volume. I think that's what's happening with this reduction of the particles. They're ground together, but they're sort of sticky, so they spread out, they effectively take more of a volume and it gives you that much, much thicker sauce that looks very much like a reduction. I think that's what's happening for that one. So this next sauce is um, a good example of added substance. The more suspended matter, the more viscosity. So here we have some clarified butter. I've added in some shallot, a bit of kumquat that's been aged. I chop it up into a paste. The juice that was um, with the fermented kumquat. Some capers. These are Chinese dried scallop that's been steamed and then chopped up. So now we add some cream to bind it all together. So this is a traditional uh, French sauce, a granule sauce that's traditionally paired with 
soulfish or a skate wing. So I made it my version with the dried uh, kumquat, the aged kumquat and the dried scallop. So give it a quick heat and temperature and whisk it together. So because of a lot of fat content in this sauce, we've added in this kumquat and the capers to balance it out, not only in flavor, but also in the texture. So if there's a lot of fat, it can be hard to combine it together and or it might split over time. With these substances in it, it helps to bind it all together. So in this dish, I have the, um, my style of granola sauce, a pan fried scallop, that's been brined and then pan fried. And on top, I've added some um, grated hazelnut and chopped chive. And on top, the white pieces is um, pickled radish, some dill flour and chrysanthemum powder as well. Dave? So if you watch the way she cooked this, the clarified butter, when she added the solids, it didn't change the viscosity very much. Just adding solids by themselves, you have to add a large, large, large volume fraction of solids before you can really change the viscosity just adding solids. What happened was when she added the cream, that's when the viscosity increased. And what she was doing there was essentially making an emulsion. So it's drops of the cream in the butter drops of one fluid, basically a water-like fluid, in the oil. They don't mix, so they form drops, they form an emulsion, and the drops themselves occupy a lot more volume and add the viscosity. And then Vicky said something very interesting. She said that the solids prevent them from splitting. What I think she means is it doesn't, it doesn't allow the oil and the water to demix, and that's probably because the solids are wet by probably the oil, and the water surrounds them, and it just holds everything together. You'd have to de-wet the solids to cause the, uh, the sauce to demix. Thank you, Dave. So next, what is an ideal sauce? An ideal sauce can be poured easily from its container, and it can coat food which has been poured, and will not run all over the plate. So let's see the next video. So the physical properties of an ideal sauce is low viscosity when it's being poured and high viscosity when stationary on the plate. So here we have um, two pieces of Mayura beef and then I've accompanied it with some grilled asparagus. On the side there was some mushroom puree and also Chinese dried mushroom that's been braised and then added in the beef jus. It's actually made out of oxtail and beef bones into a perfect sauce that's, that you can pour in front of a customer. So lastly, I would like to say that there really is no official formula in sauce making. Ultimately, the ideal sauce is whatever that carries a bite together. The sauce in a French kitchen and a broth master in a Chinese kitchen have equal importance in producing a complete mouthfeel. Sauce is about memory and adaptability. Everyone is master of their own sauce. 
My last piece of advice in sauce making is if you are having a bad day or feeling frustrated, don't make sauce. Or a sauce <laughs> may be bitter or in a bitter caramel form. Yeah. Thank you. So Vicky, will you take some questions? Yeah. Anybody have any questions for Vicky? Do we have microphones? Any questions? Vicky, we were lucky enough to have dinner at Tate, so thank you for that. It was thank amazing. You. Thank you. Um, and this is a little, may or may not be off the viscosity subject, but you served a broth in a cup. Mm -hmm. One side was hot and the other side was cold and remained so while we ate it. And love to know how that is achieved. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is a, a 10 vegetable broth that I like to serve at the restaurant. And um, we use 10 different kinds of vegetable and lightly steam it. And then we would extract the juice from a cold presser. So it's between a juice and a broth. Um, in this, you can really taste all the natural flavors of the vegetables. And the reason why I made it hot and cold is I think when the time when he had it was around autumn or winter. I wanted to demonstrate that in winter you feel always like, oh, very hot and then very cold. That's why I created this dish. So when we um, plate this dish, we made one side that's cold with the hot broth, and I mean one side hot, boiling, and the other side cold into a more viscous state. And then we put a plastic in the, uh, in the, um, in the cup as a separator, and then we pour the two together. So the hot side would be more viscous than the cold side, actually. So the proportion needs to be right. And just before we take it out to the customer, we move the divider. Thank you. Thank you. At the top. Do you have um, a recipe book or a recipe book that you would recommend for making sauces that kind of fuse uh, Asian and French styles? I've, I'm, I haven't come across uh, one that crosses over Asian and French at the moment, but um, you could just buy two books for that and, <laughs> and, and combine it yourself. Because um, a lot of times, uh, what I would, how I would actually go about this process is test a lot of traditional recipes and I would replace certain ingredients, adding your own touch to it. For example, um, the scallion sauce, you also, I've added a lot of bit of fish sauce, so that gives the saltiness instead of just regular salt, and that gives it the Asian touch as well. Um, other example is the granule blanc sauce. Um, using a clarified butter can make a really good sauce, and you can experiment use putting different kinds of ingredient, like lemongrass or um, kaffir lime leaf. You can infuse all that into it. I don't think you need a sauce book for that. Um, my question is, uh, you used uh, zantana, and uh, does that affect the flavor of the dish? And if you don't use zantana, how else can you achieve the same um, texture for your sauces? So in Chinese cuisine, they use a lot of cornstarch or potato starch. Potato, potato starch would make the sauce even more thick. And cornstarch, as you know <coughs> as from Chinese food, they add a lot of cornstarch to thicken the sauce. Um, but sometimes cornstarch can give a bitter flavor. So that's why I added santan gum as, um, instead. It has more control. I, uh, is controlling temperature with that bravo stuff a better way uh, to cook even for other ingredients? Um, you mean when I demonstrate um, cooking the sauces, having that temperature set? Yes, yes, that's very important because uh, different ingredients need to have different temperature to be infused. For example, for the dried flowers, if I had used a hundred, more than 100 degree, the flowers would be burnt and then it might become bitter, especially the osmanthus flower might become bitter. That's why I chose to have it in the 90 degree. I mean, uh, even when you are not cooking sauce, when you cook other things, 
is it better to use that stuff to control temperature? Like ordinarily people use like gas stuff, like but it's <laughs> out of control. Um, I mean, a gas stove, um, you will get a good feel of what the temperature is like. That works out well as well. You don't always need a thermometer. But in the kitchen, in, um, in the professional kitchen, we try to be more consistent because everyone's feel might be different or you might have a lot going on and you want to control more. So we have the more temperature controlled cooking methods so that everyone will cook the same sauce every single day. Any other questions? What's my favorite sauce? Um, I'd say it's an emulsion. Yeah, like a, a oil and a vinegar. I, I like that paired with something raw, like a raw shrimp or something. It's at the very back. <laughs> so it takes a while to transport there. Uh, hi. Do you hi. use polysorbate for anything? Sorry? Do you use polysorbates for polysorbate? anything? Polysorbate? Um, you mean the stabilizer in ice cream and sorbet? The emulsifier. No, I haven't used, I've used some sort of that for ice cream, if that's related, yeah. So sometimes we add the stabilizer when we cook the ice cream into um, like 82 degree with the eggs and then we add in the stabilizer before we freeze it. So it helps it when, when you take it out as an ice cream, it's more stabilized with the, um, after freezing. What, what stabilizer do you use for that? I've used a polysorbet for that, and there are a few other ones that can be used. Okay, thank you. Hi, I was just wondering why you chose French cuisine in combination with Chinese cooking. Cuisine. That's interesting, because um, actually when I first started out, because I was French trained, um, naturally I would uh, want to use that in my cuisine because uh, they make a lot of good sauces. Um, but at the beginning, I actually paired a lot of my food with Japanese cuisine. But slowly, I realized one time I um, interned at a three-star restaurant in Kyoto, I realized I have no understanding of Japanese cuisine. So slowly, <laughs> I've taken that out because Japanese cuisine can look so simple, but it's so complicated. It's so much into the ingredients that, um, yeah, maybe I should explore something that I know more. That's why, I, and I want to get back into my roots being Chinese, and that's why I've chosen French and Chinese. Hi. Um, what's your least favorite sauce to make, or at least when you were in culinary school? Was there one that was more challenging? And then uh, my second question is for beginners into making sauces. Do you have any tips or tricks um, in terms of handling viscosity and how to go about delving into making sauces? I'd say the most fun and difficult sauce to make would be the meat sauces. Um, a simple chicken jus uh, can be quite difficult because at the, as, a, at the, as a beginner, you need to really feel how much you can caramelize the chicken and when to add it into the broth. And actually you have to make a broth and then grill all the bones and then combine it together into making a sauce. So the process is quite long. Sometimes it takes three days. So um, even at a restaurant, we would make it ahead of time in case that sauce doesn't work out. It, we will really need another three days to put, output it again. So we give ourselves a little bit of time. But that's definitely the most fun sauce to make some sort of meat sauce or fish sauce can be nice as well. That takes a shorter time, but you will have to run the fish bone a lot in the water and then you can cook it. And just under three hours, you can have a very nice fish sauce. Peter there. Um, how, how do you come up with your ideas for how to uh, plate your dishes? 
Um, sometimes I tell a story like when in the in the cover of this uh, the first screen. The beehive one. Um, some of these dishes are plated according to um, what I was thinking of at that time. Like, for example, this one, I wanted to express more of a bamboo garden. And then this other one, it's um, an imitation of a lake in China uh, with shrimp and tea. So I often used all these elements that I think in my head. That's why that was described. And this is a, a beehive dish that I serve as a petit four at the restaurant. So the story behind this dish is that I was looking for more local ingredients, homegrown ingredients in Hong Kong. But because of the real estate being so expensive, I wasn't able to find much. But I actually found people farm bees on the rooftop. So I used those honey to make this petit four that I serve at the end of the meal. So ideas come from everywhere in terms of plating. Hi, there's some questions on that. Oh, here. There's some on that side, too. Yeah. What did you use to make the bamboo in the other picture? That's like a twill. So it's um, a kind of a paste of uh, flour and eggs. And then um, I use a stencil and stencil it and then he put it in the oven. And when it's like between cooked and not cooked, I would roll it up and then reheat it in the oven a little bit more into a cone. So it's, it's actually a twill. Hi, thank you so much for, for a beautiful presentation. I have a question. So I make a lot of sauces too, but really frustrating is that the sauce always breaks. So the mouth feel, what you talked about, it always ends up really greasy. So what recommendation, like what am I doing wrong? that keeps the sauce breaking. <laughs> um, is this meat sauce that we're talking about? It could be like a meat sauce or like, like even mayonnaise, I have a lot of trouble. It just breaks a lot, so it takes a long time to make and it just never, like the mouthfeel is never right because it just feels really greasy. Mm -hmm. um, so for the meat sauce, one trick is that after you cook the sauce, because you actually need to add quite a lot of oil when you stir fry the meat and bones, and actually you can pour out some of the oil and keep it on the sides because actually the oil has a lot of flavor. And then you can reduce the base and then add the oil back in the end. Or you can, after you cook it, you can put it in the fridge and then overnight the oil will flow up to the top. And then you can skim out the oil and then reduce the bottom again and then add in the oil separately on your plate. That ha gives you more control as well. Because when you use a spoon to scoop up um, a spoonful of the meat sauce, a lot of the oil would tend to stick like to the top. And then s the first few dishes you put will have a lot of oil. So it's better to separate the two and then incorporate it in the dish. Here. Um, so I saw that you have um, some of the sauce, which like a touch of like, Asian or um, like the kumquat uh, that you put into a more Western base with like butter or cream. Mm -hmm. But I'm also curious about your opinion or have you ever tried adding a little bit of Western elements onto a more Asian base sauce like soy sauce or like fish sauce? Yes, I have. Um, so for example, in the beef, um, I. On top, I've put in a layer of mushroom puree, actually, a mushroom sauce, like a mushroom soy sauce. Um, so that I have aged some mushroom water and concentrated it and added a little bit of soy sauce to it. So that's kind of like a, my take on the soy sauce. My question is similar to one that was asked previously. Because you have a graphic design background, when you're coming up with new dishes, do you start off with an idea of how you want the end product to look like? Or do you work from what flavors you'd want to accent or what ingredients you want to use, and then go to the visual um, element last? Mm -hmm. um, I'd say it's always ingredients-based. When I think about a dish, um, I get most inspired. And actually, nowadays, the hardest thing in the kitchen is to find nice ingredient. So I always look for that nice ingredient, main ingredient that I want to work with first. And then I would try like 20 different ways of cooking it. 
and then what should I pair it with? And now I have everything in front of me and then I think about how I'm gonna plate it. So the process can be a bit long. That's why we don't change our menu like every other day. But, um, but yeah, it's fun to, to do that. So remember, everybody's sauce is their own, and let's thank Vicky one more time. <laughs> <laughs>